Okay, I think um, it is now past 30 minutes, past the hour, so I think we should probably get going. Uh, so welcome everyone uh, to another session in the 2021 uh, CGU online talk series, where we're hearing research presentations from all parts of the CGU. Um, as you probably know, the talks are going to run um, on most Tuesdays and some Thursdays uh, until sort of late July, July 20th, I think is the last day. Today, we're going to be hearing a series of talks that are part of the Solid Earth section. Um, this is the second Solid Earth uh, section session, um, and we will be having a third in uh, the middle of July. Uh, my name is Claire Curry. Um, I'm from the University of Alberta, and I'm also currently the president of the Solid Earth section. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Alberta is located on Treaty 6 territory. We respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First People of Canada, whose, president, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. I'm joined by uh, Erkan Gunn and Russ Pisklovec from the University of Toronto, who are helping to convene this session. Um, just a couple of notes. We will have eight talks in this session with a 10 minute break after the first four talks. Uh, during the break, we will run a promotional video for next year's CGU meeting. Uh, that meeting is going to be held in Saskatoon in late May to early June. And the theme is science serving society. So hopefully by next year, we can all gather in person, which will be the first time since 2019. And I hope you'll all be able to attend that meeting. Um, so we will have those eight talks today. After each talk, there will be a question and answer period. If you would like to ask a question, you can submit that uh, using the Q&A box, which I think you'll find at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Um, you can type in your question at any time during the talk. And at the end of the talk, we will read these to the speakers and they can answer your questions. Um, however, if you prefer to talk yourself to ask the question, Please just note that in the Q&A box, and then we will open up the microphone to allow you to talk um, and speak to the speaker yourself. So with that, um, I'd like to pass this over to my co-convener, Erkan, who will introduce the session. Uh, thanks, Claire. Um, hello, everyone. Before we proceed with the talks, um, we want to give you a brief intro about this. Uh, uh, lithosphere tectonics and mantle dynamics session. Um, as Earth's outermost layers, the lithosphere and mantle are continuously in complex interactions, and these interactions can create a wide range of tectonic behaviors from large scale plate motions to interplate deformation or local plate boundary tectonics. Some examples that can arise from this complex lithosphere mantle dynamics can be listed as um, subduction and collision zones. Also, vertical tectonics, such as lithospheric drifts and delimination, or mantle flow and anisotropy as a result of convection or mantle uh, or plate motions. Although these processes have been studied with a variety of tools, for example, geophysical and ge uh, geological observations, numerical and analog experiments, there are still more to explore. We think that today's cross disciplinary representations will provide. Um, new perspectives to understand not only Earth, but also other planets, internal and surface tectonic processes. Um, speaking of other planets, our first speaker, Joshua Guerrero, I hope that he's here right now, uh, will open the session with their research on Mercury's mental convection processes. Uh, Joshua, if you are ready, please share your screen and go ahead. Everyone can see my screen, yes, I take it. Okay. Uh, all right, so I'd like to thank the organizers for accommodating me for my time zone. It's currently 1.30 a.m. in Taiwan. Uh, so welcome to my talk titled, the, uh, Did the Cessation of Convection in Mercury's Mantle Allow for a Dynamo Supporting Increase in Heat Loss from its Core? 
So this project continues the work done in the final chapter of my thesis under the supervision of Professor Julian Lohman. So let's talk about Mercury's uh, magnetic uh, field. Joshua, yep. uh, sorry, I think we are seeing your... Um... Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Hold on. You know no what? I'll problem. just share some. I'll just share the something else. Hold on. No problem. I missed my mistake. Uh, is this better? Hey, yeah, it looks good. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, so moving on. <clears throat> Uh, so let's talk about uh, Mercury's magnetic field and core heat flow. Um, so Mercury's magnetic field um, uh, is a fascinating phenomena. Uh, from geochemistry and, and interior structure models, uh, we know that it has a liquid outer core and its magnetic field has been ruled out as a paleomagnetic remnant, which suggests that it must be internally driven. That is, a dynamo exists. So. The presence of a dynamo suggests that there's a minimum amount of heat that uh, is extracted by the mantle. So on the earth, um, mantle, uh, the mantle efficiently extracts heat by convection, but for mercury, it clearly doesn't have a uh, mantle that drives uh, plate tectonics. So it must be cooling through a very um, um, weak mantle convection or through conduction. So this adds a little bit to the mystique. So how does mercury rid itself of heat efficiently if it isn't convecting? There must be some interesting properties of mercury's mantle. So based on mercury's uh, iron poor surface composition, uh, its mantle is predicted to also be iron poor. But recently mineral physics studies have shown that these increased uh, values in thermal uh, diffusivity and conductivity result from an iron poor composition. So this will result in an enhanced heat flow at the uh, CAMB, whether by convection or conduction. So in this study, uh, I've, I look at different dynamo compatible mantle models uh, that are determined by different mantle and core parameters. So uh, the mantle convection model that I use uh, assumes that the mantle is an incompressible Boussinesque fluid. Um, the governing equations are shown on the left. Um, and the calculations are performed using a fully 3D spherical shell geometry and are initiated uh, with a solidus initial condition um, with random temperature perturbations. So the system uh, can evolve over time uh, with a dynamic cooling uh, bottom boundary condition um, that include the effects of inter um, inner core formation and it features decaying internal heat sources. And so these calculations run for uh, a dimensional time that encompasses the age of the solar system. So here I choose 5 billion years as a calculation period. Uh, the main controlling parameters include uh, initial internal heating rate and uh, thermal diffusivity. And so both, both uh, parameters are considered uniformly distributed. So there's no spatial variation. Uh, the thermal diffusivity value commonly used in numerical mantle convection models is one times 10 to the negative six uh, meters squared per second. And Mercury's initial um, internal heating rate uh, is roughly 30 picowatts uh, per kilogram. So these sample calculations shown on the left uh, are for different pairs of uh, kappa and chi. Um, and they highlight, the first two columns highlight two cooling histories that have transitioned from a stagnant lid convection to conduction uh, with uh, present day heat flow that's compatible with the dynamo. And the third column here shows a case that has convected with stagnant lid convection up until present, uh, but with insufficient heat flow uh, compatible with the dynamo. So I'll, I'll go through this model constraints uh, in the next slide. Uh, so the other model parameters that I do end up varying are uh, reference viscosity, and for the core, I include different fractions of uh, the light element in the core. So uh, the constraints and considerations I have for my models are as follows. Uh, the minimum heat flow relevant for a Mercurian dynamo is between 12 to 19 meters, um, uh, sorry, uh, milliwatts per meter squared. And I take the lower bound as a threshold value. 
And the range of internal um, inner core sizes uh, that I consider are 0.3 to 0.7. These bounds are based on interior structure models uh, that depend on core composition as well as relative concentration of the light elements in the core. And lastly, uh, the total planetary contraction um, since the late heavy bombardment period uh, has an upper bound of seven kilometers uh, and a lower bound of two kilometers based on surface observations. So these constraints will often be indicated by dash towards off the lines of the figures that I present. All right, so moving on to the first results slide, um, we look at the sensitivity due to internal heating rate. So thermal diffusivity is fixed to two times 10 to the negative six. Um, and the initial uh, internal heating rate is being varied. Uh, and so the time series are being plotted here for different output uh, parameters, such as the uh, temperature of the core mantle boundary, the heat flux of the core mantle boundary, the mantle system VRMS, uh, the uh, inner to outer core radii ratio in the, uh, in the core, um, and the internal heating rate, chi. And so this last panel um, for internal heating rate shows that the internal heating rate is indeed uh, decaying over time with a three billion year uh, half-life. And the first thing to note here uh, with the time series is that uh, uh, as convection ceases, uh, the core metal boundary heat flux attains a minimum. So you can see this clearly with the blue curve here. Um, and at the subsequently uh, increasing rates of internal heating rate, uh, conduction uh, uh, takes over after this local minimum and increases the uh, heat flow. And it can also reestablish um, the heat flux at different points uh, in the model's lifetime. So if we're looking at the case with uh, chi is equal to 30 uh, at a time of uh, 0.5 billion years, uh, you have heat flow going below the threshold value. And at 1 billion years, uh, convection ceases. And at 1.75 billion years, uh, the heat flow is reestablished to be above this threshold value of 12 milliwatts uh, per meter squared. Uh, inner core formation uh, is, is uh, also um, increases with heat flow. And so for higher internal heating rate, uh, inner, the uh, inner core formation will be delayed. And uh, furthermore, this means that younger inner cores uh, will be smaller at present day. And so for the, uh, uh, thermal diff or for the thermal diffusivity uh, presented here, the small to moderate size inner cores form for internal heating rates between 10 to 30 picowatts per kilogram. And so, uh, the effective internal heating rate can be clarified by looking at the temperature profiles for these same cases uh, that were presented uh, just now. Uh, so the dash curve in the first panel indicates the solidus initial condition. So when uh, convection ceases, the thermal gradient at the CMB uh, becomes steeper. That means uh, flatter towards the x-axis. And when internal heating uh, is lower, mantle cooling is enhanced so that the interior temperature uh, decreases and the core heat extraction is greater. Uh, moving on to the sensitivity due to thermal uh, diffusivity, uh, initial internal heating rate is fixed to 30 picowatts uh, per kilogram and thermal diffusivity is varied. So the time series here plotted for the same um, output parameters as before, except for internal heating rate. So regarding the cessation of convection, uh, we find that convection ceases earlier for higher kappa values. Uh, and at the lowest kappa value tested, so uh, kappa is equal to one times 10 to the negative six, uh, very weak mantle convection can persist until present day. So in general, uh, core mantle boundary heat flow um, increases with increasing kappa um, and the dynamo compatible cases are found with kappas uh, greater than or equal to two times 10 to the negative six for this internal heating rate. Uh, so similarly with previous cases uh, that were presented a couple slides ago, inner core formation is initiated earlier uh, when core heat flow is greater. And here, this means when 
cap is higher. So moving on to a summary of the res uh, results of um, different uh, kappa and chi. Um, uh, the symbols indicated are in the legend and most, the most important uh, symbols being open and closed symbols, which indicate whether um, sufficient heat flow is attained to support a dynamo. Uh, and so the color bar here indicates the relative inner to outer core size um, and dynamo compatible heat flow uh, follows a monotonic uh, trend in kappa and chi along this diagonal where uh, you see uh, the transition from solid to open symbols. And so for small to moderate inner core sizes, so from these blues to green, so 0.3s to 0.55s, um, we find that there's like a narrow, narrow band along this diagonal for very uh, small to moderate size inner cores. Um, and lastly, we, uh, I, I uh, point out that there's a very weak uh, mantle convection that can persist at this lowest internal or lowest uh, thermal diffusivity rate that was tested uh, at the highest uh, internal heating rates. All right, moving on to uh, the sensitivity of initial fraction of light elements in the core. Uh, so for the dynamo compatible cases that were found in the last figure, uh, for small to moderate core sizes, uh, we test the sensitivity of different fractions of uh, sulfur in the core. So for all the calculations that were presented previously, I'd assume that there was 10% uh, fraction in the core. And so now I'm testing uh, for lower values. So for 5%, 7%, and for a higher value of 12%. Uh, so for these calculations, all uh, three constraints that I'd mentioned are uh, being considered here and presented at a case-by-case -case basis. Um, uh, as a function of, uh, for planetary radius contraction as a function of initial fraction of uh, sulfur. And so here the cases are presented for cap is equal to two times 10 to the negative six and a chi of 30. Uh, so the symbols and colors here indicate the same, um, same things as before in the summary figure, but here squares uh, mean that no inner core has formed. Um, and so uh, in here, we consider different physical parameters for the core aside from the initial fraction of sulfur. So this includes the thermal expansivity where the higher value of 5.8 times 10 to the negative five corresponds to shallower depths in the um, liquid outer core. And because we didn't model melt, a range of present day crustal thicknesses uh, provide a bounds uh, for radial contraction. So the solid uh, red and blue curves correspond to a mean um, crustal thickness of 50 kilometers uh, at present day. And the lower bound is corresponds to 20 and the upper bound corresponds to 80 kilometers. And here the dash black lines indicate the estimated planetary radius uh, contraction for Mercury. So less than seven and less than two kilometers. So moving on to this uh, summary uh, figure for uh, the sensitivity of initial fraction of light elements. Um, so the cases are presented similar, similarly to the summary figure. They're arranged in an ascending order. Uh, so in general, inner core size increases uh, with decreasing initial core fraction of sulfur. Uh, so on the higher uh, CL side, a, an inner core may not form except for uh, you know a few uh, cases with uh, cap is equal to 2.5 and chi is equal to 30 and cap equal to 3 and chi equal to 40. And on the low CL side, uh, the inner core may grow too large. Uh, so this can be explained because the liquidus uh, temperature increases as CL decreases. And so because our initial condition um, is held fixed to a specific core mantle boundary temperature, and it also corresponds to uh, uh, um, a specific inner core temperature. So the timing of the inner core formation uh, may curl, uh, occur earlier uh, when CL is low. Uh, so in summary, cases with dynamo compatible heat flow, uh, which are also consistent with the observed planetary radius contraction is possible when small to moderate inner core sizes uh, are formed. So for uh, CL equal to 0.1, 
they have um, the most cases that overlap with these radial contraction bounds. And so moving on to what I would like to consider in future work and directions. Um, so I'd like to consider a temperature dependent thermal diffusivity. So in the work that I presented, uh, thermal diffusivity is a bit idealized. So uh, with a temperature dependent formulation, uh, we may be able to get more efficient heat flow uh, later on in the calculations or later on in the evolution when the mantle is cooler relative to earlier in the evolution of mercury. Um, I'd like to consider different uh, heterogeneous internal heating. So um, heat producing elements partition to the surface uh, during mantle differentiation, and they might result in different cooling histories because you know the there's heterogeneous like distribution of internal heating or um, heat producing elements, and they have different uh, decay constants. Um, and the last thing I'd like to consider is melt generation and crustal formation, and this may allow for more realistic uh, planetary radius uh, contraction calculation, and maybe more relevant to discussions regarding the cessation of like volcanism on Mercury. And so, for my conclusions, uh, that uh, conduction. Uh, a conduction cooled mantle either sustained or at a later time reestablished the required cooling for a dynamo as observed at present day. Um, a higher thermal diffusivity would be a sufficient condition for heat extraction from a mercurian core through mantle conduction at a rate compatible with a magnetic dynamo. And present day dynamo compatible heat flow consistent with the constraints of planetary contraction are found for cases with small to moderate intercore sizes. Um, and as a short answer to the question posed in the title, yes, it may be possible to get more heat out uh, through a conducting mantle, but further work on this problem featuring a variable thermal diffusivity is still needed. Thanks. Great, thank you very much, Josh, for a very interesting talk. Um, so we do have a couple of minutes for questions and I see that there is already a question in the Q&A box. Um, maybe I'll ask that. Uh, Phil McCausland uh, says, hi, Joshua, very nice study. Would surface heat added during the late heavy bombardment at circa 0.9 GA model time affect or delay heat loss significantly at that transition time in your models of CMB and core evolution? Um, I believe that having, uh, when you mean uh, surface heat added, you, I, mean, I imagine it means internal heating. Uh, I, I imagine that if you had more internal heating at the surface, it might uh, stifle the amount of heat um, that you lose at the surface. Um, but you know, having more internal heating rate at the surface would actually increase the amount of heat that leaves through the surface itself. So I'm not uh, uh, not exactly sh sure how uh, it might transition. Uh, affect the transition time uh, for the models uh, from my CMB. But uh, I imagine that it, if it's hotter at the surface, it might, if it stifles the heat flow uh, by a little bit, it, it might delay uh, when inner cores are formed. Okay. Uh, um, okay. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to squeeze question? one more <laughs> question in. Sure. Um, what kind of viscosity law are you using for your simulations? That's a question right. uh, from Rob. Okay. Uh, so uh, thanks, Rob. Um, I'm using a, an Arrhenius, uh, purely temperature dependent uh, Arrhenius viscosity law in my simulations. Uh, so I, I, um, I pin the reference temperature at 1600 uh, Kelvin and have a total viscosity variation of 10 orders of magnitude uh, from the core mantle boundary to the uh, up a cutoff point in the lithosphere. So th this value isn't um, constant, like the viscosity contrast isn't constant through time. It does decrease as the core mantle boundary temperature decreases. Okay, um, unfortunately, I think we're at the time that we have to move to the next speaker. Um, so. I think you might be able to answer Sam Butler's question can, right yeah, in the Q&A box. I can answer it. Okay. okay thanks. <laughs> okay. All thank right. you very much again, Joshua. Uh, do I stop share? So, or can someone um, stop yeah. this for me? 
Uh, you oh, should be okay. able to stop I, it there. Okay. I'm, okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks again. Um, so our next speaker is Hussein Shanas. So Hussein, are you there? Yeah. I'm here. Okay. Um, so you should be able to share your screen now. Okay, our second uh, speaker today is Hussein Shanas, um, who's going to tell us about super Earths. So go ahead, Hussein. Okay. Uh, today I'm going to show you some. Uh, Today I'm going to show you some uh, results from numerical models about the possibility of uh, plate tectonics on massive rocky planets. But first, a brief review. Uh, plate tectonics is a key factor in the habitability and evolution of life uh, on planets by stabilization of the atmosphere through the uh, bio elements and its surface temperature. The only uh, known habitable planet is our planet Earth. Uh, plate tectonics is an enigmatic problem, and the problem is it, it, its initiation. Uh, even for Earth, for which we have data from continents, the onset of uh, te plate tectonics ranges from over 4 billion years up to seven, 800 million years ago. And the mechanism responsible for uh, plate tectonics initiation of plate tectonics is not well understood. The natural way for uh, cooling planets is uh, from the interior by, interior by heat conduction from uh, interior by uh, advection and conduction to the surface to the base of a stagnant layer and from a stagnant layer by conduction to the surface and also by volcanism. A stagnant uh, system is a stable system like the ball in this uh, potential well if it is perturbed after few oscillation it returns back to its uh, equilibrium state. So the, there should be a substantial forcing mechanism for, plate, for the initiation plate tectonics. And uh, among the hypotheses, it, it is uh, the impact of a large uh, impactor of size like uh, 1,000 kilometer in diameter, uh, which may have uh, fragmented and broken the lithosphere uh, with the size of uh, Pacific Ocean. During the past few, uh, few years and the past uh, two decades, there have been a number of numerical works around this, but the difficulties are they are using uh, different initial conditions and parameters and also there are a number, uh, there are uncertainties in the rology and the mantle parameters. And uh, most of these models are simple models. In order to uh, a planet to be uh, habitable, its surface temperature should be within some range, not very hot, not very cold. And this is a plot. Uh, this axis shows the surface temperature. Here is our sun, 6,000 uh, Kelvin at the surface. And this is the radiation, the uh, uh, rate of radiation the planet rece receives. This is the conservative zone, which uh, is more likely to have habitability. And this is hot conditions. Here is our Earth 
Mars is at the outer edge and Venus is out of the boundary. And these are a few other exoplanets which are uh, assumed to be uh, have habitable conditions. The work of Stamenkovic uh, and his co-workers uh, who they uh, used one dimensional parameterized conviction and strong viscosity, they showed that as the mass of uh, planet increases, the sluggish uh, convection in uh, deep mantle moves to stagnant CMB lit at the top of uh, core mantle boundary. If the condition, if the initial uh, temperature is hot, this may uh, continue for longer time in deep mantle as sluggish convection. They also uh, found that full mantle convection because of high viscosity is not uh, likely uh, and keep in deep mantle due to this stagnant lid uh, at the top of core mantle boundary is by conduction. They also found that the thermostat effect, which is uh, due to the uh, uh, temperature dependent of the viscosity is not efficient with a strong uh, viscosity. And the duration of volcanism also decreases as the mass increases. In summary, they found that as the mass increases with this uh, strong viscosity, the habitability and plate tectonism is uh, less likely. However, the work of Paul Tackley and his co-workers, who they uh, used two different uh, rhology uh, with uh, fast diffusion and slow diffusion, and they found that uh, using density functional theory calculation, they one, uh, they calculated uh, mantle viscosity based on extension of, of what they have found, uh, they had found for post proscribe extending the idea to post proscribe They found that for the range of seven to 10 Earth's mass, the, uh, the mantle is convecting. And also they found large upwellings and small downwellings. And uh, for hot conditions, even there might be a super basal magma at deep mantle. So they found uh, convection for all sizes of planets. Two deep finite volume convection model of Noak and, Noak and Brewer with a strong viscosity showed that the impact of initial conditions. They used wet and dry rhology and they showed that temperature has first order influence and uh, the plate tectonics is less likely with the standard or low temperatures. It increased with warm conditions and uh, also uh, the wet rheology does not necessarily increase the likelihood. Uh, some other uh, researchers uh, uh, studied the uh, habitability of planets with stagnant lead and the condition on, uh, under which a stagnant, a stagnant lead uh, planet may be habitable by uh, releasing a suitable amount of water and outgassing suitable amount of carbon dioxide. The work of Tosi uh, and his co-workers showed that uh, they used a coupled uh, model of evolution of melt generation and uh, build up water and 
carbon dioxide and also atmosphere model. And they showed that as the pressure grows in the atmosphere, the release of <coughs> water becomes more difficult. And also the Earth-sized ocean is not possible. They found the boundary for habitable zone in terms of the carbon dioxide outgassing to the atmosphere and found that for uh, high fugacity of oxygen in mantle, they found this range 0.2 to 1.2 sun radiation, and this becomes narrower for uh, lower value of fugacity. So for low values of fugacity, it remains habitable at uh, for four and a half billion years. And for high fugacity, it, it becomes quite hot after four and a half billion years. And the amount of water doesn't uh, much impacts the temperature, surface temperature. Similar uh, works done uh, by other, uh, by other, uh, by other uh, research groups showed that uh, the outgassing is more efficient in the smaller planets and becomes inefficient in large uh, planets. And finally, the summary is the habitability with uh, volcanic activities in stagnant lead regime for small planets is possible and for younger planets is possible. And it, as it becomes more massive, it, it becomes less likely. Uh, the work of Foley and his colleague also showed that for this range of uh, uh, heat production in mantle and outgassing of this range, the planet is habitable for one to five giga year. But beyond this, it goes to hot climate, climate or uh, glaciation. Other work of uh, Foley also found that for outgassing uh, budget three order of magnitude less than uh, less than the uh, Earth and one order magnitude more than the Earth, the climate is habitable. In this study, I am going to show you the, a massive planet. It is DJ eight seven six. And uh, it is, its mass is about 7.5 uh, uh, of mass of Earth. Its surface temperature is in this range. And based on uh, rocky structure of uh, the, uh, we assumed from this work, we uh, got this structure, internal structure of density, and this is the gravity, which uh, ranges from 33 to uh, 26 uh, meter square uh, at the surface. There are, we have included all transitions this is the alpha to beta spinal transition, which occurs at 20 gigapascal. Uh, this is corresponding to, uh, this, this one occurs at 170 kilometer depths in this uh, large super planet. The second one endothermic at 20, uh, 270, and the third one at 10, this is post, uh, proscrite to post proscrite at 1070. And there are another uh, transition at about 0.5 terapascal, which is a structural uh, transition which causes uh, 
viscosity reduction. The last one is the dissociation of transition, the dissociation of post-proscite to other elements, which uh, is endothermic uh, transition with high Clapeyron slope. So this is the standard viscosity which the people are using. This is the viscosity uh, which is uh, 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 based on the theoretical uh, study of Creto. So uh, rather than increasing, increasing in decrease at pressures over 0.1 and another decrease step like uh, decrease at 0.5, another decrease at dissociation transition, and another decrease might be due to metallization of oxides at deep mantle. We are using uh, uh, 3D compressible control volume uh, model. And uh, this is the uh, uh, geometry of the planet. Temperature uh, at the surface is 500, and we choose two different temperatures for core mantle boundary. And these are temperature dependent and pressure dependent thermal conductivity and pressure dependent thermal expansivity. So thermal expansivity cha uh, change uh, uh, varies by a factor of 10 throughout the mantle, and these are the thermal conductivity I have, I'm showing here uh, model two and model three. Model one is similar to one uh, model two. And as you can see here, as the, uh, in the last model, we have higher CMB temperature and the, uh, the thermal conductivity uh, has got a kink here. For higher uh, CMB temperature, this kink is very pronounced. So in the first model, I am using four different viscosities, uh, which uh, with contrast about with contrast about uh, about uh, ten to four. So as you see, for high viscosity, the uh, here I have I am comparing the models with dissociation and without dissociation. So each model, for this model with high viscosity, the dissociation, uh, the model with dissociation and without dissociation are the same. But as the viscosity decreases, the dissociation, uh, uh, the impact of dissociation we can see uh, in the mantle layering in deep mantle layering and this is uh, the velocity radio velocities RMS velocities as we can see uh, from the kinks caused by, by dissociation transition Hussein there's about 30 seconds left in your time okay, okay. as <laughs> as we can see it is with dissociation uh, transition we have focused Plumes like this, and the plume in the and the velocity inside the plume rises to five. Uh, in the second model, I have chosen this uh, kind of uh, viscosity, and we can see similar effect. But since the, at the transition depths the viscosity uh, is high, the layering is weak, and we have more than one plume. In the last model, I have chosen temperature dependent also, temperature dependence in the model. So the plume velocity rises to 10 centimeter per uh, year. So this is the statistic within the plume. This is the velocity uh, 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 histogram sorry, showing temperature anomaly and uh, Velocity anomaly. So within the plume, uh, we have high velocity and high temperature anomaly. This is off of the plume, the green uh, uh, histogram, and this is in the subduction region. So 
with the plume. And in this slide, I am showing that there is possibility of core dynamo because of this uh, CMB uh, heat flux. And this is, uh, sorry, and this is the conclusion. I'm sorry for, <laughs> okay. Great, um, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time to take live Q&A, but um, if anyone does have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box and I'm sure Hossein will be happy to answer them by uh, typing the answers. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, it just went too long. So um, our third talk is from uh, Judith Confell. So Judith, you should... Okay, so now we're going to move to the Mediterranean uh, for Judith's talk. So go ahead, Judith. Much. Yeah, we are going back to Earth. Um, yeah, I will show um, some methods to correct uh, seismic tomographies with um, uh, anisotropy, and the anisotropy comes from numerical models and shear wave splitting measurements, splitting intensities, and yeah, uh, I will show that on examples in the uh, Mediterranean. And yeah, I would also like to thank my co-workers uh, at Istanbul Technical University and uh, the INGV in Bologna. And yeah, so um, anisotropy in general is um, if uh, the minerals are not aligned in a chaos, but uh, in certain directions. Um, this can happen, for example, in natural fractures or also in upper mantle due to mantle flow. And um, this changes the, oh, I just sort of my, can you still hear me? Uh, yeah, you're loud and clear. I don't know, my, I think my video stopped, but I will. Okay, yeah, your video is frozen, but we can hear you and see your mouse moving. Okay, I will just continue a bit like that. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, so um, the elastic properties of uh, the seismic wave change for uh, shear waves. This means, for example, it splits into two quasi waves and one is faster than the other. Um, you can measure the um, direction um, of these uh, waves and uh, also the time delay. And this relates to the anisotropic properties of the layers. Actually, um, Judith, um, it yeah. seems to be showing your title slide. I'm not sure if you're on there. Now it's jumped ahead. Okay, so it's influence of upper mantle anisotropy is the yeah. title. Yes. Is that okay? Yes. Um, but you can still not see my um, video, right? Yeah, your video is like you are frozen, but your mouse is moving. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So, and for P waves, this um, can affect um, depending on if we have horizontal anisotropy or vertical anisotropy. This can, um, yeah, get some artifacts um, in the tomography. And um, until now, usually um, tomographies uh, use, um, don't use uh, anisotropy. So they uh, pretend or like they, because it would mean a lot of more pa parameters uh, into the inversion. Um, so um, yeah, but they also become more and more um, detailed and the interpretations of them become more detailed. And um, so the question is if we are interpreting sometimes artifacts or if we don't see some small uh, structures in the 
tomographies because we are not uh, including anisotropy. And um, yeah, my studies are mostly about uh, subduction zones and especially in subduction zones, it is very important um, to include anisotropy because we have very different directions and uh, orientations of, and of strong anisotropy. Yeah, so um, the first uh, study region is the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, just shortly, we have the African and Arabian plate moving towards the north. Um, at the Hellenic Trench, we have an Oceanic uh, plate. Judith, it yeah. doesn't seem to have gone to the map. Um, I don't know if you want to try stop sharing and then try it again. Maybe it's some kind of weird connection. Um, Yeah, that's showing the map. Okay. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, we have the Hellenic Trench where an oceanic plate is subducting and the uh, Cyprian Trench uh, where we have uh, subduction, uh, continental, continental subduction and already a collision zone here. Um, between those two trenches, we have um, a tier and in Eastern Anatolia, we have a break off zone and the uh, Anatolia is uh, moving towards West um, because we have a very strong um, uh, rollback here. Can you see the next slide? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so meaning this mean, what this means for anisotropy, what we know from shear wave splitting is that uh, we have mostly uh, northeast southwest directed anisotropy here, and the strongest anisotropy is in the rollback area in the Aegean. And um, different directions, we only uh, have probably around the tier, but not enough measurements yet there. And also, there are some other um, patterns in the Peloponnese. Um, yeah, so what we wanted to do is um, try to model the region um, in a synthetic model um, and do that for around 20 million years, what we suspect is um, the most recent uh, subduction um, uh, circle. And we did first a numerical flow model and then estimated the anisotropy for um, the the, the grains, and then with that we calculated average SKS splitting. And this was our um, initial model. We have kind of the African uh, Arabian plate here. Then we have an overriding overriding continental crust, and in between we have an oceanic crust. And we used some weak zones to initiate um, the subduction and also uh, the tiering. And so you can see that the subduction is initiated quite fast. Then we have a nice rollback. The tiering starts at some point. And also when we look from the other side, we can see that the break off is um, occurring. Um, so this means we have more or less the, the most important features. Of course, it's a, it's, it's a simplified model, but we have all the features that we wanted to, um, to, to, to have in the model. And they are also occurring more or less at the uh, expected time. And so what this means for the mantle flow in the last time step uh, is that we can see very good the effect of the tier. Um, otherwise, we have more or less like a north-south directed in, in a lot of region. And we, we can see that the slab is affecting the, um, the, the direction. And we can see that um, also in, in, in lower um, slides, depth slides, we can see that um, the mantle flow to the break off is also quite strong. And when these are now uh, the uh, velocity field on uh, vertical slices. And here we can see that, especially 
um, at the subducting slabs, we can see uh, some dipping uh, anisotropy and um, yeah, also at the edges of the slab, there is sometimes some circular um, movement. And this can be also seen in the anisotropy. So the, mostly the, the only dipping anisotropy we can see around the slab. The most intense anisotropy, strongest anisotropy is in the back arc region. Um, otherwise, uh, in, bef before the slab, uh, it is not so strong. Um, yeah, and if we compare that to, um, to real data uh, from shear wave splitting measurements, um, we can see that, yeah, we, ha we have the trend of um, trench perpendicular fast polarization direction is good represented. Um, the strongest ones, as also in, um, in shear wave splitting measurements, the strongest one are in the back arc region and um, some circular movement in the, in the shear wave splitting measurements can be seen very good in the model, in the synthetic model. Uh, in the real data, we can see this trend as well a bit. And yeah, so in general, also with, when we compare it with all the um, tomography studies, we see, um, yeah, that our model, at least in a simple, a simplified way, represents um, the area, uh, the tectonics of the area quite well. And with that, we can interpret um, some of the movements and anisotropy. So now I'm coming to the tomography study that we did. And um, yeah, we had a very good data set. Um, the station distribution was very good. So first of all, I'm not going too much into the tomography itself. So in general, we were able to get a very, very detailed um, model of the, of the plates and the subducting plates and all its small uh, flock fragments, tiers. Um, we found some new tier in um, the, underneath the Catalonian fault zone uh, that we were able to, um, to, to, to see in our model. Um, then we got a very detailed um, geometry also of the Cyprian Aegean um, tier. And yeah, so this was, first of all, um, um, yeah, regarding the, uh, this, the, the geometry of, uh, the, of the slab. And now I'm coming to the part where we included anisotropy into the uh, tomography. So we did um, two different kinds. First of all, we uh, included the anisotropy from the numerical model. And um, for that, we, of course, had to um, change a bit the geometry, um, but we were somehow able to um, fit, fit it somehow. The good thing about the numerical model is that we have uh, vertical and subvertical anisotropy, which in real data we do not have. So in, from if, when we included um, the, the SKS um, splitting parameters, we only have horizontal anisotropy but um, of course they're from real data. Therefore, um, yeah, we also did a trial with that and um, interpolated that on a single layer. Um, yeah, so these are the results. We have the completely isotropic um, uh, tomography and then the one where we corrected for the anisotropy of the numerical model and where we corrected for the anisotropy of SKS measurements. And you can see that the, the big um, anomalies are more or less the same. And uh, so the interpretation of that, we, we, yeah, we can, we can do them without any problems. But if you go into some details, especially um, in the area of the slab, you can see um, some differences. For example, when, uh, when we include this dipping anisotropy, we have a lower anisotropy, uh, lower uh, velocities, perturbations here. And also when we look at the differences between those figures, and um, yeah, we have, especially in the slab area, in, the, in this um, area where we have the, the strong rollback, 
and we have differences of up to two percent more or less and which could influence the interpretation of um, these areas and these are some um, yeah some some cross sections uh, of the area and here again you can see that yeah for example this lab you can see it uh, in each uh, in each model but for example the geometry um, is quite different for example here we have some anomalies which are not seen here or are different here the intensity for example of this anomaly uh, is less strong in when we um, corrected for SK, uh, S um, anisotropy. And yeah, so there are uh, different areas where it made a difference, but others, um, yeah, where we can interpret the same way. So generally speaking, um, we had a bit of uh, an increase in the quality. Um, so the variance reduction um, increased a little bit and but not as much as we hoped and um, this could be because yeah the the amount of vertical anisotropy is not that large because the area of the slab is not that large and this is um, where yeah p wave uh, velocities get affected the most and uh, otherwise also we have a very lateral northeast southwest directed um, pattern of anisotropy therefore um, yeah it might also yeah explain this small increase in uh, the quality and yeah so um, the next project uh, is still related to correcting uh, tomographies now I'm going into the Alps where we also have a quite complicated uh, subduction system with several slabs and tiers and uh, here we're looking again into the anisotropy and um, first we, we, we were looking at uh, the back azimuthal dependencies to see if we have uh, multi uh, layers or if we can see that from the back azimuthal distribution because there is a lot of data in the region but um, yeah we, we, we were looking into if we can find more um, from that. Then um, the main project is there to look into splitting intensity. And for now, we, we just did that on some synthetic data um, and splitting intensity um, is uh, you're projecting the transverse to the derivative of the radial and then you get in uh, splitting intensities. They depend on the back azimuth. So the good thing about this is if it's dependable on the back azimuth, um, you also have a depth dependency. So um, you can include that de depth dependency into tomographies. So first of all, like we have, yeah, we have a lot of stations in the area and each of these stations is uh, the, the shear based splitting parameters are calculated with the uh, with the sinusoidal curve curves of the splitting intensities and we can see here so here we have uh, the slab uh, moving towards west and we can see um, the uh, mantle flow at the edges and uh, lower and um, anisotropy uh, behind the slab and in front of it and when we in, uh, invert for that in um, the splitting intensity uh, uh, tomography, and we can we get uh, depth dependencies. So yeah, and for now uh, they're looking quite okay, um, and they will then later on be included into um, a tomography. For now, this is just the synthetic data. Um, I'm now working on the real data and hopefully have enough stations with good data, not too noisy to do that. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm sorry for all the difficulties with the with the video and stuff. Uh, thanks, Judith. It was a great talk. Uh, we have some questions for you. Uh, Tianxi is asking. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Uh, 
very nice talk you did. Uh, can I ask? Uh, can I ask? How did you estimate anisotropy from dynamic modeling results? Also, how much uncertainty in the anisotropy field should I expect from this kind of estimation? Thanks. Okay. Um... Okay. Um... So um, from so the, the anisotropy is um, calculated from so I mean we, we define um, yeah the specific parameters of uh, the upper mantle and then oh, like we we run the model and with that we we um, have the mantle flow so we um, yeah the the minerals align in certain directions and um yeah with that more or less uh, the the um the anisotropy or the field is calculated it's maybe going a bit too much but into the details but uh yeah i mean either in the paper that i mentioned here or also Manuela Facenda had a few papers on that uh, that can be read. And then in the uncertainty in the anisotropy field, um, do it, okay, I'm not sure, is that in the, in the synthetic model or in the tomography? I mean, in the synthetic model, like it's it's a synthetic model. So I mean, more or less, yeah. But we, um, um, like it's more or less certain um, because it depends on the parameters that we put in, and the uncertainty in an anisotropy field that we corrected for in the tomography is of course very uncertain because first of all i mean the, the numerical model is not very certain because it's a synthetic model and the uh, shear wave splitting is only horizontal and uh, single layer therefore it's yeah it's quite uncertain therefore we are trying out with splitting intensities at the moment to get a bit more certainty but yeah i guess i mean this is yeah we are trying out different ways to make it these corrections uh, more certain, but yeah, this is definitely a, a thing that has to be worked on still. Thanks. I think we have a quick question time too. So Claire, uh, you have a question as far as I know? Um, yeah, uh, actually it follows up nicely from uh, the last question. Thank you for a very nice talk. Um, I was actually wondering um, how much, I guess, strain is needed to develop anisotropy? Like, I'm just wondering if we see measurements of anisotropy, how far in the past um, can we interpret them? Or is, is it, if there's a change in mantle flow, does it very rapidly overprint? Okay, I mean, interesting question. I mean, we, we can see, from from fossil and uh, from fossil slabs, for example, we can also see anisotropy. This is, for example, also one of the um, things about in in my numerical model. We didn't include any subduction zones that were before, and Turkey is one of these places where there have been the last few hundred million years. There were so many subduction zones, so there is probably a lot of um, fossil anisotropy. I mean, we're trying to figure out if we can see that at the moment still. I mean, the question is also like, I mean, at some point probably the, the, some of the um, some of the slabs are getting included into the mantle again. So the anisotropy probably also is less, but um, definitely fossil anisotropy is, is, is there. And yeah, is, this is, yeah. <laughs> Great, <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks, Yudit. It was a great talk. Uh, now we are going to move from Mediterranean region to South America. Um, Shi Hong Pan is going to uh, talk about Central Andes and initiation of Central Andes. 
Uh, please go ahead, Shihong. Yep. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. everything is good. Yep. Okay. Okay. Good. That's good. Mm. Hello, everyone. My research is about the initiation of central Andes insights from 2D numerical modeling. Uh, as we all know, the central the Andean Cordillera is, uh, is a mountain belt that extends over 6,000 kilometers from along the west mountain of South American plate. And it's the largest mountain belt in the world without uh, continent collision. And my work addressed the initiation of the Deformation in Central Andes. The, Andes can, the Central Andes can be divided into uh, several morphotectonic zones, which in, includes uh, coastal cordillera, pre cordillera, western, western cordillera, the Atlano and Puna Plateau, eastern cordillera, and the sub Andean zone. And there are some uh, unique char characteristics for the Central Andes. The Central Andes has the highest deformation and is currently from the high plateau uh, with an average elevation about 4,000 meters above the sea, sea level. In addition, uh, the Central Andes is characterized by the thickest crust uh, with a large area in it, uh, in excess of 60 kilometers, and uh, it has maximum shortening, crust shortening, which can up to uh, 300 kilometers. So the formation, but the formation of uh, Andean erosion were meant to be uh, enigmatic since there was such a large mountain chain formed uh, in the subduction zone without evidence of the uh, arc continent uh, collision. Uh, in this study, I will focus on the slab dynamics, um, continental lithosphere structure, and uh, overriding velocity, and uh, examine how these parameters uh, can influence the deformation during the subduction process and uh, correlate it with the natural ending origin. Uh, in this, in my research, I use a 2D thermal mechanic models. Uh, to study the Andean deformation, uh, and the model is based on the uh, finite element code, so pair. Uh, and here is the setup of my refer reference model, uh, a two-dimensional model is oriented uh, in the direction of the plate set convergence. And the model domain has a width of 4,000 kilometers, and it extends from the surface to a depth at uh, uh, 1,200 kilometers. The thickness of the oceanic crust uh, is 80 kilometers, uh, which includes uh, 800, 800, uh, 8 kilometers oceanic crust and uh, 72 kilometers uh, oceanic mantle spare. Uh, the continent part uh, has a uh, 1,200 long, uh, 100 thick margin plate lisa spare and uh, uh, 2,040 and 400 long, uh, 200 kilometers thick craton path. Both of them include uh, uh, 28 kilometers upper crust and, uh, and uh, 14 kilometers lower crust. Subducting and overriding velocities have been applied to to the two sides of the lisa spare based on average values over the last uh, 30 million years. And uh, in my model, all materials use the viscoplastic uh, uh and uh, all of them have a time temperature dependent density. In addition, we, planned, we implement phase changes for the, uh, in our models for the oceanic crust and the uh, continental lower crust we include echolytic atmospheric phase changes for the continental upper crust, and we include echolytic and co-side echolytic uh, atmospheric phase changes. 
and uh, the figure in the right hand side shows the uh, temperature per fire. Uh, and here's the evolution uh, for our reference model. The total time for the evolution for the, for the model run is uh, 30 million years. This model has implemented an uh, overriding velocity of 7.5 centimeters per year and uh, uh, a, 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 a subtracting velocity of 7.5 centimeters per year and the overriding velocity of 2.5 centimeters per year. And the viscosity for the lower mantle is 10 to the uh, power of 22 Pascal per second, which is around uh, 10 times larger than the deep upper mantle. Uh, in general, the evolution can be divided into two stages. Uh, you can say during the first stage, it within four, uh, four million years, the oceanic plate continues subducting at a a very step angle, and the slab can sink freely into the deep, uh, deep up mantle. By four million years, the slab reaches the uh, boundary between the up mantle and the lower mantle, and the evolution enters into the second stage. Uh, during this stage, we can say the sinking of the slab is inhibited by high viscosity, lower mantle, and the oceanic place starts to fold. Uh, with a force pulling at around 600 kilometers depth. As the subduction uh, continues, uh, we can say the foliar slab penetrates, uh, overcomes the resistance due to the viscous jump and uh, penetrates into the lower mantle. At the same time, we can see the, uh, at the same time, we can see the continent part experience uh, deformation, experience the compression stress and starts to deform. And uh, by 30 million years, the slab have folded several times. Uh, and most part of the folding uh, sinking to the lower mantle. And during the evolution, we can see, we can also see the materials from the crust has been dragged down uh, track down, uh, which can represent the subduction, uh, erosion process, and some of them uh, being dragged uh, to the mantle, and some of them the laminates in the mantle of this fail. And here is the uh, horizontal defectoric stress uh, profile, and the blue color indicates the extension, while the red color indicates the uh, compression. We can say before the slab enters into the lower mantle, the crust uh, in the margin plate, in the margin plate experience slightly compression uh, after, but right after it enters the, into the lower mantle, the margin, this is where experience um, uh, compression, stronger compression. And the uh, left hand, right hand side figure shows the trench motion. Trench motion can be an, indication of the uh, deformation, cross deformation or cross shortening uh, from this figure, we can see the continent uh, uh, deformation can be divided into two stages, two episodes, first episodes uh, of deformation occurs before four million years. And uh, the second stage is after that. During the first stage, uh, it shows a higher uh, trench movement rate due to the subduction urine and while uh, the trench moves, um, the trench, while the trench motion rate becomes stable during the second stage. And, uh, the, st and the total trench motion is 275 kilometers and 29% uh, uh, is contributed by the subduction erosion. Uh, in this study, the three parameters have been uh, examined, which includes the slab dynamics, uh, uh, overriding velocity and uh, continental uh, variety for, for the influence of slab dynamics uh, on the continent deformation we study the interaction between slab and uh, lower mantle. This is done by changing the lower mantle viscosity. Here, our personal model with a very weak lower mantle uh, is 10 times weaker than the first model. Uh, and this 
the viscosity for this model is 10 to the uh, 21, 10 to the power of 21 Pascal per seconds. Uh, and we can see for this model, the slab can enter, can easily enter to, enters into the lower mantle and gets back around uh, 1100 kilometers. And at least almost no foliance occur in the lower mantle. And with the uh, continue of the subduction, the trench, you can see the trench rolled back uh, and the margin is fair experience uh, extension. You can see from the, you can also see it from the uh, trench motion uh, movement figure here. We also investigate the influence of the overriding velocity of the continent plate. Here I present the model uh, with with the overriding velocity of five centimeters per year, which is uh, twice larger than the reference model. Uh, we can see the slab uh, also gets folded uh, when touch the boundary uh, of the lower mantle, but the subducting slab angle, subducting angle is shallower and the slab is dominated by the horizontal deformation, uh, horizontal movement uh, is rather than the vertical thinking. And we can say the continent part also experience uh, severe uh, heavy deformation. When you look at the trench motion, the total trench motion is 450 kilometers and 17% uh, um, is contributed by the subduction lower. In addition, uh, continent rheology is also a parameter uh, tested in my research, uh, our present model with a weaker margin least scale. The cross virology is the same as the reference model, but the, with a 10 times weaker uh, mental least scale. And here is the model evolution. Uh, we can see the slab descends into the lower mantle and is deflected when it encounters the high viscosity lower mantle. With a continuum of subduction, the folding of slab enters into the lower mantle. In addition, we can see loss of drips uh, from uh, margin, margin mantle this spell and the margin part, uh, can say the margin part experience extensive uh, deformation. Yeah, loss of drips and experience, content part ex experience uh, extensive deformation. And when we compare the uh, Trend motion with the reference model is clearly can be seen that the trend motion, uh, the, amount, the amount of trend motion is around 100 uh, kilometers larger than the reference model, and 19% uh, is contributed by the subduction erosion. Uh, in addition, I also want to present the model without continent uh, deformation. For this model, the continent is stationary. The cross biology is 10 times stronger than the reference model, but with the same um, mental spheric biology. We can see the evolution uh, for this model. A slab also starts to fold when it touches the high viscosity lower mantle. And uh, however, due to the lack of uh, continent motion, the slab, the subducting slab accumulates uh, below the uh, trench region rather than moving laterally. Uh, this this leads leads to the significantly uh, vertically piled up of the uh, slab with most part entering uh, with most part entering to the lower mantle. Uh, during the evolution we can barely see any deformation in the crust in the crust part. It's the most no deformation. Uh, after the surface, we check the trench movement. Uh, the trench experience almost no movement during the model run. Uh, based on the current study, I, we can get a short uh, summary here. The model shows that the subduction slab encounters the high viscosity lower mantle. The slab descends is is inhabited 
causing the slab to fold and the folding process can promote the continuing the deformation. The rarity of the lower mantle is a K control of deformation with larger joint motion uh, and earth deformation for stronger lower mantle. The structure of the overriding plate is also important with greater deformation for weight continents. And the overriding velocity of the continent is such an important factor with greater deformation for a larger with velocity. Uh, for the future work, uh, we are I will focus more details on the natural angles and correlates and correlated with uh, our models. For example, the deformation in central angles first uh, occur in the west part and the mixture migrates to the east part. We will use the reference model as the starting point uh, and explore the like, effect of uh, continent structure on the detailed deformation. For example, I will uh, impl implement the uh, weak zone in the margin plate list crust and uh, vary the position, uh, the scale of the weak, weak zone and see how it will uh, influence the continent deformation process. Uh, well, I think that's all for my presentation. Uh, thank you and I'm happy to take uh, any questions or comments. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Shi Hong. It was a great talk. Um, I don't see any questions in the box. Uh, I may have a question. So I realize that your imposed uh, convergence velocities are quite high, like around 10 centimeters per year or so. Yep. Have you also considered uh, running models without any imposed velocity, just a slab pool is acting? Uh... Uh, I actually I don't want uh, any more without without uh, uh, the conversions. Uh, but I I've run I do run a few models which with a uh, with a smaller convergence convergence rate. And uh, for that model, uh, I can get a sm small amount of joint motion, which means uh, less less deformation in the counting in the part. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we have one uh, more question, Rob McRoy. Shi uh, Hong, nice talk. What type of viscosity law did you use in this in this study? Uh, for the for the for the uh, lower mantle, I use the power law uh, viscosity. For the for the uh, for the upper mantle, I use the power law viscosity. For the uh, lower mantle, I use uh, I use a uh, constant uh, viscosity because uh, I didn't include uh, uh, like the diffusion and uh, dislocation uh, in the lower mantle because uh, uh, our purpose is to investigate a viscous jump uh, how it will influence the slab jump so instead of uh, uh, focusing instead of focusing too much details on how uh, the diffusion or uh, dislocation, uh, how these factors will uh, uh, influence the slab geometry. And uh, I think uh, uh, some, uh, some previous work regarding the, uh, the slab geometry, uh, the influence of the uh, interaction with the slab geometry, slab and uh, uh, mantle, they also uh, impose the uh, uh, constant viscosity for lower mantle and uh, uh, they, they think it's, it's reasonable. Oh, thanks. Uh, we have two more questions, but I think we don't have time before the break. Uh, maybe you want to uh, answer them on the uh, and I, uh, question box, question answer box. And now we are going to have a break for five minutes and we are going to start 305 with nice talks about vertical tectonics and supercontinent classification. We'll see you soon. Oh, thanks coming back. So we will continue uh, with David and David is going to present us uh, 
littles for removal in northern Colombia. Go ahead, David. Thank you very much. Okay. I'll share my screen. Okay. Okay, so as he said, uh, my name is David and I'll talk about surface observables of little for removal in northern Colombia. Uh, specifically, my research is focused in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, which is this mountain that you can see here in the picture. The Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta is isolated from the rest of the Andes Cordillera and is mostly formed of the an exhumed and shallow uh, igneous metamorphic basement with outcropping igneous rocks from the previous magmatic episodes. Um, it has a maximum height of more than 5.8 kilometers. And as you can see in the map on the right, it has a positive Booger gravity anomaly, which is clearly above 100 milligals. These observations uh, suggest that there's a very thin crust in the region. So that would mean that the mountain is not in isostatic balance and that there's um, other forces that contribute to its support. And there's also other studies that suggest that there could be a high heat flow in the area, but this um, data is scarce. Anyway, uh, the purpose of this research is to um, identify if there's possibly leaders for removal in this region if there has if it has occurred and if it could explain these type of observations. So the approach that we use is uh, a two-dimensional numerical modeling using the software aspect. Um, we use the business approximation, meaning that the materials are incompressible. Uh, the, ma the material parameters for the litosphere and the mantle are standard for the litosphere and upper mantle. Uh, and uh, I show the domain from the surface to the 660 kilometer discontinuity. Uh, as you can see, the boundary conditions are free slip at the lateral, lateral boundaries, no slip at the bottom, and a free surface on top. This rectangular region shows the area that I'm going to plot in the following graphs. Uh, because it's the region of interest, you can see that there is a thickened region uh, in the middle of the profile, which corresponds to the mountain region. Um, with this, uh, for this, we assume that there was a previous phase of shortening which produced this crustal thickening um, and produced also this uh, instability in the mantle litosphere. Uh, in the starting setup, we start with isostasy between the, uh, the initial topography and the crustal root below. So the dynamics is triggered at the beginning by the uh, instability of the mantle litosphere. In the plots on the right, you can see the density structure, the initial temperature, and the viscosity. Uh, the density and the viscosity are both temperature dependent. The viscosity follows the power law for this location creep. Uh, here you can see the uh, black line representing the uh, reference viscosity structure. It has the viscous rheology of wet quartzite in the upper crust, dry mill and diabase in the lower crust, dry olivine in the mantle litosphere, and wet olivine in the sublithospheric mantle. And these viscous rheologies are limited at the top with a Drucker Prager yield criterion in 2D. Uh, using a friction angle of 15 degrees and a cohesion of 20 megapascals. And there is a strain weakening when the plastic strain changes from 0 0.5 to 1.5. Uh, here, the colored lines show other viscous rheologies that I will use in the models that, I, that I'll show. For example, for the lower, lower crust, I'll also use muffic granulite, which is this blue line, eclogite, which is this uh, green line. And for the mantle literature, I'll also use the wet olivine rheology, which is this red line. These results are for the reference model, which has the same setup that I showed previously. Um, here at the right, you can see uh, the profiles for the initial, uh, for the topography, the Booger gravity anomaly, which is modeled from the density structure of the models, uh, the surface heat flow, and uh, the density maps at different time steps, uh, in this case, 30, 50, and 70 million years. And here you can see an animation as you can see, there's no, not a significant change in the topography or the gravity anomaly. There's only this mantle litosphere drip, which produces an increase in the heat flow as the litosphere becomes thinner. Um, now, uh, I created this model, model B1, uh, which has the same setup as the reference, but it has ecologization in the lower crust. So if this happens when the temperature is, the temperature is above 680 degrees Celsius and the pressure is above 1.2 gigapascals. If that happens, then the density increases to 3,550 kilograms per meter cube uh, as the equilibrium density. Here, uh, what you can see is that the lower crust starts uh, turning to equilibrium, 
then there is a mantle leadership drip followed by the complete removal of the crustal root. Uh, you can see how that affected the observables of topography and gravity here. Uh, from this model, I created the set B, which has the same setup, but I try different lower crystal rheologies. So for example, model B1 has the reference rheology, which is dry mineral and diabase. Model B2 has a local mafic granulite just in the region of the mountain in the center. And model B3 has a rheology of mafic granulite all along the profile. Overall, you can see how um, including a weaker rheology as mafic granulite produces a decrease in the topography and an increase in the surface heat flow. And it also speeds up the mechanism. Um, for model C1, uh, I use the same setup as the reference, including also ecologization. And there's also wet olivine locally in the mantle lithosphere. So that's a weaker rheology. In this case, the behavior is similar to the previous. There's ecologization, there's this mantle lithosphere drip and complete removal of the crystal root. But this happens much faster this time because of the wet uh, and weaker rheology of the mantle lithosphere. Um, based on this model, I created the set C which has the same alterations in the lower crust as the set B, just that in this case, it has this wet olivine in the mantle lithosphere for all them. So for example, model C1 has dry mineral and diabase, C2 has the local mafic granulite, and C3 has the uh, mafic granulate all along the profile. Uh, so to understand uh, and compare the results from all these models, I report here the value of the observables of height, gravity anomaly and heat flow right on top of the mountain averaged over a 50 kilometers window uh, and how that value evolved in time. So if we look first at the black line, which shows the reference model, we see that there's not a big effect in the topography and there's just a little increase in the heat flow because of the removal of the mantle lithosphere. And in the gravity anomaly, we see this jump, uh, which is caused by the drip of the mantle lithosphere. For the rest of the models, there's a subsidence induced by the lithosphere removal, the topography drops, uh, for the gravity anomaly, we see an increase, which reaches a maximum right after the complete removal of the crustal root. And then since the load of the mountain starts sinking back again, thickening the crust, there's a decrease. Uh, and in the surface heat flow, we see an increase, but that's a bit after the uh, removal of the crustal root because it takes some time for heating to reach to the surface. So uh, you can compare the models of set C uh, to the blue lines of set B and see how, how much it made the behavior faster. And um, uh, the overall behavior of the topography uh, shows that there's a mantle literature drip that induces subsidence. And then are, there's an increase in the subsidence rate at the moment of the removal of the crustal root. And then uh, the height reaches an equilibration. Um, another important observation is that in models B3 and C3 with mafi granulite all along the profile, are the only models that produced uplift after removal. And that is because at that point, the surface topography is so low that it is, the load of the mountain is exceeded by the upwelling of the sublithosphere mantle, and it, it allows for some uplift. Um, so then I took the uh, results from model C, from the cell, from set C, sorry, uh, all of them. And I did calculations of the isostatic topography which would be the topography that would be observed at each time if there was isostatic balance according to the whole density structure. And that's the whole density structure, including leaders here and mantle. And the results are these green lines. So you can see that it's much lower. And I calculated the non-isostatic part of the topography uh, as the difference between the, the, normal, the total topography and the isostatic part. And the interesting result is that, for example, for model C1, uh, the non-isostatic part of the topography is above three kilometers. Uh, meaning that at the time of the removal, which is approximately at that time, most of the topography is non-isostatic. And there's also this uplift rate of this non-isostatic topography of 0 0.36 millimeters per year. Uh, now to gather all these uh, results for how the leadership rheology affect the observables, um, I did these plots. Here I show the value of the, of the observables of gravity anomaly, surface heat flow, and height. Uh, at the moment when the um, gravity anomaly is at its maximum right after removal uh, in the top row and in the bottom row 10 million years after. Uh, that's for all the models. And that's shown as a function of the mantle leadership rheology and the lower course of rheology. So the rheologies are weaker to the left here and weaker to the top here. Uh, the first observation is that there's not a big effect produced in the gravity anomaly 
all the values are between 20 to 30 milligals, um, which is positive, but it's still much lower than the observations. And 10 million years after, the trend is the same, but the values are lower. For the surface heat flow, um, initially we see that there's a higher heat flow in the models with dry olivine in the mantle literature. That's because the, there's a slower removal. So this time of the maximum gravity anomaly occurs later. So there's more time for heating. But this is not quite the, the behavior that we want to see. It's more what happens after because there's, there has been enough time for heating. So uh, at this time, uh, we see that weaker rheologies for both muffin granulate and wet olivine, lower crust and mantle litosphere. Uh, there's more lithospheric thinning, uh, and that produces more heating. For the topography, we can see that the stronger lower crust provides more support for the orogen load, and that's why it has higher topographies towards the left. And uh, if the mantle industry is weaker, there is a faster removal. So uh, since uh, the root is removed faster, then there's less time for the mountain to sink, uh, producing higher topographies at that time. And uh, this trend is maintained for also 10 million years after, but the magnitudes are lower. Now, these are some cross sections of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta from previous gravity, gravity modeling studies. Um, these studies, they have uh, in general different um, models, different approaches, but uh, they all agree that the density of the rocks of the basement that it's uh, exhumed and shallow in the region is very significant for the gravity anomaly, and they include that uh, difference. So, following that, I did model set, modeling set D which is the same as set C, but it has a uh, density uh, in the upper crust uh, locally in the mountain, 100 kilograms per meter cube higher. So you can see that in all these uh, density maps. Uh, and including that effect, uh, I compared the observations in time uh, with the reference model C1 as the reference. And we see that the load of the denser block produces a little bit lower topographies, but it's uh, not too um, dramatic, dramatic defect, not too drastic. For the gravity anomaly, we see the same behavior, just that the denser uh, upper crystal uh, block produces an increase in the gravity anomaly, of course. And there is not a significant change in the surface heat flow, as you can see here. So from all the models that I showed, I chose model D1 as the preferred one because it maximizes the simultaneous occurrence of a high gravity anomaly and a high um, topography. Um, I compare here those results uh, of the model uh, at the time equals zero and at the time right after removal, which is 23 million years, uh, compared to the observations uh, across this line, uh, which are shown here in black for topography and gravity anomaly. So, uh, first of all, for the initial gravity anomaly, you can see that the effect of the denser block on top, it's small compared to the negative effect produced by the crystal root. And after the full removal, the gravity anomaly is closer to the observed values. For the topographies, uh, these are uh, still smaller, but uh, it's still a high mountain together with this high gravity anomaly. Uh, this dashed line shows the isostatic topography at that time, uh, right after removal. And this one is the non-isostatic topography. This confirms that the topography at this time is mostly non-isostatic, and also that it is very localized in the region of the mountain. Um, and now in the next couple of slides, I want to focus on other type of evidence that could be used to identify if there, if there has been litosphere removal in this region. Um, here I did calculations from the models to see if there is possibly melt being produced. I used the uh, dry granite solids for the upper for the crust and dry peridotite, peridotite solids for the mantle. And the result is that yes, the zones that I've shown here um, are places where the uh, melt could be formed by decompression and the subsequent heating in the lower crust could produce this melt. I also did calculations for the melt volume per unit length. And this showed that the mantle, the, the melting is triggered right after the removal and that the mantle melt and crustal melt are comparable, the volumes are comparable locally, just in the region under the mountain. Uh, this is important because this is something that could be preserved in the rock record and could be observed depending on the timing of this uh, little removal event. I also did calculations of the seismic wave velocities because um, this is also another type of evidence that, evidence that could be used. Uh, these contours show regions where the mantle, where the, the mantle could melt 
So these regions could have potentially lower velocities. Um, overall, the results show that there's a low velocity anomaly uh, under the mountain. And this is important because this could be observed in the, um, in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta uh, through a tomography. Uh, so from all these models, um, the main takeaways would be that to the first order, lead soil ripping and crystal root removal are compatible with the observations in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta that a locally weaker mantle lead soil rheology and a rheologically strong lower crust facilitate the existence of both the Wugger gravity anomaly uh, and the high elevations, uh, that non isostatic topography produces a significant contribution and allows for elevations to be maintained after root removal, and for that the contribution of both full crustal root removal and high density uh, shallow rocks is required to explain the gravity anomaly. Uh, for future work, it will be very interesting to study this behavior in 3D because it is more appropriate for this uh, setting, and also it will be important to consider the elasticity in the numerical formulation because this material model is visco, uh, viscoplastic, so it would tend to produce local exostasy, while in this case, uh, elastic stresses are probably very important and could uh, produce a significant uh, contribution to the support of the mountain. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, David. Um, are there any questions? Let's give it a couple of seconds to let people type. Um, actually, I think one of our panelists has a question. Um, Russ, do you want to shout out your question? Sure. Uh, great talk, David. That was that was excellent. Uh, you really broken down the topography, and it's it's fairly complex there. I, I guess my natural question is for for some of your future work. Are you looking at horizontal deformation as well? I'm curious on two parts, what the models might show. I'm not sure if you've looked at it. I think ASPEC could do that, uh, but also the geology. So do we see zones of extension, contraction, compression in that area? So part one is, is there any ob observables that might show that that exists? And two, have you thought about doing it for the modeling? Uh, so you mean about uh, like uh, deformation patterns in the surface, right? Like extension or contraction zones. Yeah, um, it's a bit complicated because uh, in this in these models, I try to look at the isolated effect of the drip dynamics. But in the real scenario, this is a bit close to the uh, a boundary between the Caribbean plate and the South American plate. Uh, there's probably a flat uh, slab subduction nearby. Uh, so it's difficult to know which patterns in the surface are, are caused by the uh, boundary uh, between the Caribbean plate and which would be produced by the, the drip. Um, I guess there's a lot of deformation of contractional deformation in the, in the center. Um, but it, the answer would be that it's hard to, to do that, to, to observe that. Observe it in the models or in nature? N no, in nature, in nature. In models that could be observed, of course, and that would be interesting to, to see, yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, um, give it five more seconds for anyone to get a question in. And if you do have any questions afterward, um, you can type them into the Q&A box and then uh, I'm sure David can answer by typing back. Sure. Okay, I think um, let's move to the next talk. So thank you very much. Sure. I think we are going to stay with the theme of lithosphere removal processes, but using a slightly different technique. Um, so our next talk is by Julia Anderson. So I think you should be able to share your screen. Okay. Yeah, looks good. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Julia. I'm a PhD student here at the University of Toronto. And today I'm going to be talking to you about 3D crustal analysis of symptomatic versus asymptomatic lithospheric drip removal uh, with insights from analog modeling. 
So um, just as an overview, I talk about the mantle lithosphere a lot in this presentation. So I just wanted to point out where I'm actually referring to. So the lithosphere is comprised of the crust and the very uppermost mantle, which is more rigid and that's um, overlying the weaker asthenosphere. Um, so when I say mantle lithosphere, I'm talking about that very uppermost mantle. So there is um, geophysical evidence, mainly seismic tomography that reveals areas with mantle upwelling um, and previously thinned um, or descending mantle lithosphere. So for example, on the left, we have the central Anatolian plateau and you can see this orange region, which is a lower velocity region where the mantle has upwelled into this um, sort of chunk of missing mantle lithosphere, which is the bluer high velocity region. Um, and then here on the right, we have the Great Basin in the Western United States. Uh, the study they were doing there, they were looking at extensional features in the basin. And when they completed tomography studies, they actually realized that there was this downwelling of mantle lithosphere beneath the basin. So what is exactly is a drip? It's a proposed mechanism for removal or thinning of the mantle lithosphere. Um, it's an intraplate tectonic process, meaning it's happening within the plate boundaries, not at the margins. And um, it's a mechanism that produces deformation in the crust, such as uplift, um, contraction, thickening, or depression. And we think these um, initiate from something called a Rayleigh-Taylor instability, which is an instability forming between layers with a contrast in density. So if you see the diagram on the right, uh, sometimes the mantle lithosphere has a higher density than the underlying mantle, and that can happen through tectonic processes or uh, metamorphism forming eclogites. And so what happens is it starts to drip into the mantle, and as it's dripping, it starts to pull the crust inwards, thickening it, and uh, we get an uplift. And basically what happens is the drip will thin um, and pinch away, and we have this chunk of mantle lithosphere missing and it the mantle will uplift and replace it. So what these structures would look like, you can see this photograph here at the top. This is from an analog model, but if you can imagine on um, a kilometer height scale, that's what these um, thickening and convergence structures would look like. So where are these actually occurring? Um, in hinterland regions such as the Altiplano Puna Plateau in South America, um, can also occur between uh, beneath craton, such as the North China craton, um, or possibly the Wyoming craton, and um, in general in interplate regions such as the Central Anatolian Plateau. So the analog models are a physical 3D model that I've made in the Tectono Physics Lab at the University of Toronto. And I'm using a high resolution technique called particle image velocimetry, which I'll talk a bit more about in the next couple slides. Um, but what the setup looks like, I have in the lab these two overhead cameras that are recording the surface of the model. And uh, those images are combined to create a stereoscopic image. And then to record the um, progression of the drip beneath the surface, I have a side camera here. Uh, these cameras are all synced to each other. They take an image um, once every minute. The model runs for 40 or more hours. So I have uh, one image per minute for 40 hours and then uh, these are connected to a recording software on the computer and that's where I would do the PIB analysis. Uh, so this here on the right is just a photograph of what the analog model actually looks like. So the materials that I used um, for the mantle, I'm using polydimethyl siloxane or PDMS, which is like a viscous silicone material. And then uh, for the mantle lithosphere, I increased the viscosity and density by mixing in clay. Uh, in most cases, I did a total of 10 models, which take about two weeks to complete just because you have to let air bubbles come out of the PDMS. Um, so in most cases, I only used a brittle upper crust, which was e, e spheres and silica spheres, which are kind of fine grained and um, uniform in shape. And um, in one case, I did include a lower crust. And so these models are scaled for time, length, density, viscosity, and gravity. 
uh, it's a one-to-one -one ratio for gravity and the models um, are dripping just by gravity pulling the instability down that I initiated in the center. So these are just some videos of what the camera footage looks like. And basically how PIV works is it's interpreting changes um, in the motion of little markers in the sand um, between each photo. So we can get information like displacement, velocity, stress, uh, and surface elevation. So this is the side camera footage. You can see these downward arrows are tracking the motion of the drip and the little yellow arrows going up are actually showing the PDMS rising as um, the mantle lithosphere is being removed. So once I've done image analysis, we'll get a side camera image like the one here on the bottom. Uh, and these vectors, I can look at again, velocity displacement, and I can see what their magnitude was. Uh, this here on the right is the raw camera footage from the top. And you can, if you look at the center, you can see it converging uh, while it was dripping. And um, again, after doing PIV, I would get surface images like the one here at the bottom. So this is looking at surface elevation. The blue represents depression and the lighter areas are higher elevations. And you can see the vector showing that horizontal motion inwards. So basically why I was um, collecting all of this camera footage and collecting these images is because I was actually trying to get data sets from this. And this is because I was trying to understand how rheology affects 3D deformation in the crust. So for each experiment, I was changing the, the viscosity and density of the mantle lithosphere. Um, and I wanted to see, one, how it changes the, the structures that we can see in the sand, but also if that would change how the topography evolved over time. So basically, um, I have one image per minute for 40 hours. I would take a horizontal cross section um, over top the area where the drip was. And so each crop section represents one line of data. I just focused on the center where the drip was located, um, decided to pick the minimum value of each uh, line of data and just see how that changed over time. So we would get um, a plot like the bottom right here. So I'm just gonna show you three representative experiments. These all actually have the same rheology for the mantle lithosphere. Um, so experiment one was about 40 hours and you can see in the center we had sort of a subsidence where it starts to become darker in blue and then um, lighter as the surface uplifted and then this photograph down here at 40 hours is showing you those convergent structures where the drip actually pulled the crust in making these little ridges. This uh, here might have been an extensional feature but it was a little bit difficult to tell. So if you look down here at the bottom, even though the vectors are a little bit messy, you can still see it's tracking downward motion of the drip and upward motion of the mantle. And um, you can see that it's actually removing quite a bit of mantle lithosphere material. And even after it reached the bottom of the box at 40 hours, there was still material being removed down the column of the drip. So when I looked at the surface topography changing over time, it looked like this. Uh, so for about the first 15 hours, we had a subsidence. Um, and then as the drip thinned, the surface started to lift. And so we actually had um, an overall uplift. So experiment two, even though we had the same rheology as experiment one, actually looked kind of different. Um, so after 40 hours, we didn't see any cr crustal features or structures forming in the crust. Uh, the PIV camera still detected a slight uh, depression, which looks like this green area, but to the naked eye, it was just a flat surface. It kind of looked like at zero hours, there was movement towards the center above the drip, but it wasn't enough for me to physically see it in person. So this drip looks a little bit different than experiment one. Uh, the sort of neck of the drip is a lot thinner and much less material being removed from the mantle lithosphere. And then the, how, the way the topography evolved over time was also different. Um, it kind of started off in a subsided state and we just saw an overall uplift over time and then sort of no more change. So if there was a period of subsidence, it was really quick and it happened before we had even started recording. 
This is experiment three. This one was really nice. Um, I included a, a viscous lower crust in this experiment. And you can really see that surface subsidence. So we have darker um, blue region and really strong movement towards um, the center above the drip. And what was really neat at this one at 45 hours, you can see these arrows moving in opposite directions. That was actually an extensional feature opening up, which you can see in the photograph here. Uh, and the PDMS actually rose up through the mantle lithosphere. And the lower crust actually added, uh, we, we got a lot more ridges forming. Uh, this cloud here is just clay that dissolved in the PDMS. But again, you can see this is a really thick drip and a lot of uh, material is being removed. And the way the surface topography evolved was similar to experiment one, except we had a really slow period of subsidence and then a really fast period of uplift. So from all the 10 experiments that I did, um, we kind of classified two types of drips. So asymptomatic versus symptomatic. A, a symptomatic drip is sort of the classic type that I've been talking about where we have this active removal, pulling the crust in, creating these convergent structures here. And um, an asymptomatic drip is kind of the opposite. So even though we have active removal of the mantle lithosphere, we're not seeing any expression of that in the crust, um, except by maybe a slight depression. And so that kind of suggests that there might be active removal processes happening um, that are not expressed in the crust. And so what I think is the reason for this is that an asymptomatic drip is not well coupled to the upper mantle lithosphere, so it's not really influencing the upper part of the system. So I decided to do a little comparison with the Arrozaro Basin in South America in the Altiplano Puna Plateau. So the Arrozaro is represented by the AZ here. Uh, my colleague made this diagram. These are seismic tomography data. Uh, this, these are blobs are sort of high velocity, dense um, downwellings beneath the basin. And this one tracks uh, a prime tracks pretty well to the Arrozaro. It's slightly offset, which could be due to the Nazca plate subducting beneath it. But um, a group, Peter Dussel in, and his colleagues in 2015, sort of were looking at the overall evolution of um, elevation of the Arrozaro basin over the past 20 million years. And they actually interpreted that there's probably a drip beneath the basin that had formed the basin. So. Um, it started off where they had this instability forming, it subsided, and then um, the basin uplifted. And so I decided to take their data and put it uh, in comparison to my data from the three experiments that I did. And uh, if you look with experiment one and the Arrozaro, they actually track pretty well um, temporally. I think the, the drip beneath the surface in experiment one it probably scales larger than the Arrozaro basin, but we have this sort of period of subsidence over 15 million years followed by uplift. And the age of my model is older than the age of the Arrozaro basin, but it does slightly suggest that the um, basin might uplift over time. And so uh, experiment three also looks quite similar in shape with that period of subsidence and then uplift. So that sort of suggests that the Arrozaro basin might be a symptomatic drip, whereas experiment two looks like it's only half the curve where we sort of just see this uplift over time and we didn't see any kind of features in the crust. Uh, so an example of an asymptomatic type drip might be um, the Great Basin, where they did see some extensional features, but they didn't see any sort of those convergent features or topographic regions that we expect um, associated with dripping. So that's why they were actually surprised that um, the tomography data was showing this drip beneath the basin. Um, and there might be sort of varying degrees of symptoms as well. So just Going off of future work, I'm actually trying to create 3D numerical models um, using the code aspect. And what I want to do is sort of compare the numerical models to the, um, the analog models and see if I can reproduce symptomatic and asymptomatic drips and also just sort of compare the two methods and see uh, what kind of interpretations I would get in terms of 
sort of magnitude of subsidence or rate of uplift, stuff like that. And also what kind of features I can see in the crust in the numerical model, because the analog model is really good at showing those really fine, brittle details like in this photograph. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the next step for my PhD. All right, thank you so much. Any questions? Uh, thanks, Julia. It was a great talk. And thank it will be nice to see the comparison between numerical models and analog models, actually. Yeah. So we, ha we have a question from Phil McCausland. Thanks, Julia. Tricky analog study. Nice to done. What will be the effect, uh, if any, of independent sediment mobility with new sediment filling the downward uh, basin as the drip form? Hmm. Um, I mean, I guess if you have more sediment filling in, you might see more subsidence. I don't know if, if that would also reduce that brittle crustal response too, like you might not see the same features forming in the crust. I guess, yeah, I could try that in the lab one day maybe and see if I can sort of act slowly pour some sand on top while the, the model is running. But yeah, I can imagine that you might see more subsidence, maybe less uplift too. Um, okay, thanks. Um, we have some time, some extra questions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and Phil, yeah, Phil says, uh, or have a small fan blowing. Yeah, it's a good idea. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Sam Butler, uh, does, the, does the drip reaching at the bottom have much effect on the surface expression? Um, not really. I think after a certain point, the, the drip became so thin, it kind of stopped affecting the deformation. I think um, usually most of the convergence happened when the drip hadn't reached the bottom. So um, kind of more halfway, I would say that's when the surface started pulling in. And then at the bottom, it, it wasn't really changing much anymore. OK, thanks. Uh, any other questions? We have still some time, but for a... Oh, Claire, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. That's a really interesting set of models. Um, I was wondering in your experiment three, I think it sh you show it in the slide right before this, the compression structures are kind of linear features that have all the same trend, um, whereas your drip is, I guess, kind of a symmetrical, right? It's got like cylindrical symmetry. So I was just wondering what is creating the that linear trend? Yeah, that um, that was a bit confusing to me too because it, like it was a square box and the the instability was circular, but um, it they they always looked like that in all in all the models. Maybe it could be because the clay is kind of stuck to the edges of the box. It might be a consequence of that, but it, it sort of always had a preferred direction of contraction. So the the drip itself, even though it looks wide in this image, in um, the other direction, it was actually quite thin. So. I can't really explain why that would be. Okay, so we have Great, two more questions. Um, Julian Lohman, uh, is the difference in the first two experiments just the initial condition? Sorry if I missed something else that changed. Um, yeah, it was. So I, I kind of had two, two ways of initiating a drip. Um, so experiment one, I kind of initiated it from the top of the mantle lithosphere, I guess right below the, um, the lower crust. And then in experiment two, we initiated it from the bottom of the mantle lithosphere. So um, that would definitely have an effect on how well coupled it would be to the upper part of the system. Okay. one. Uh, last question. Um, you have 30 seconds to go. <laughs> Are there uh, analytical expressions for Rayleigh Taylor instabilities that you can compare the time scale of the growth 
of the instability to some butter last discussion. Um, I think I would have to look, I'd have to look into that. I, I, I'm not sure at the top of my head, sorry. Okay, Julia, thanks. It was a great talk. So now we are moving to Tai Cha, uh, you. So uh, this talk is going to be about the delamination in the Northern uh, Canadian Cordillera. So, Tai Cha, please go ahead and share your screen. Okay, so. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, and I'm Tai Che, and I'm working on this project with Claire, Pascal, Andrew, and Ray. And uh, today I will present the geodynamic model to investigate the recent lithosphere thinning triggered by delaminations in the northern Canadian Cordillera. In this presentation, I will just give it, I'll call it a short name, NCC. Okay. And uh, the map view shows the tectonics of the study area. The brown color displays the elevations. The dark gray area shows the high elevations and the light gray area the light area shows the low elevations. The Cordillera deformation front CDF uh, delineates the Cordillera and the crater and indicates the Cordillera eastern limit of the Cordillera deformations. The mount, uh, different mountain belts are uh, attached to the west of the crater. The regions of the regions of this the regions shows that um, er, because the Tintina fold and strike leaves fold are strike uh, because Tintina fold and Divinali fold are strike leaf fold. So so uh, sorry. So this uh, okay. I want to I want to say that the relative motions of this. Uh, could, uh, the relative motions of the relative motions of North America played with respect to the Western subduction zone and uh, influences the Cordillera regions from the extensions. It will influence this Cordillera from extensions to the compressions and accretions from the Paleozoic and the Paleogene period. So, uh, and the Tintina fold and the Denali fold are strictly fold. And the Eocene times, this um, the block at located at the west of the Tintina fold is moved northward. Northward, so the transpressions will may produce the crustal thickness in this area. And uh, the neogene volcanism in the NCVP and uh, earthquakes with the thrust type focal mechanisms in the Mackenzie Mountains suggests that the NCC is a recent active uh, tectonic environment. And uh, we, we this study focuses on the soft part of the NCC along the AA prime. And uh, today I will show you the geophysical observations such as the heat flow and the seismic image along the BB prime to understand the Cordillera lithosphere. And uh, the heat flow values in the NCC are greater than the, the loss value in Craton. And uh, we, we find out the, that this value in the Gominica and the Poland belt uh, are almost uh, two times of the Craton's values. Along the BB prime, the Moho depth uh, show that uh, at 35 kilometers from the receiver function data, which is uh, quite a flat and shallow interface. Uh, for the mental lithosphere beneath the moho, that is the uh, 15 kilometer thick. And uh, we will see the west dipping features uh, is located beneath the eastern Cordillera. The, the shore wave perturbations uh, shows the positive value for the craton with a thick lithosphere and the negative values for, for the Cordillera with a thin lithosphere. The Cordillera is characterized by uh, high elevations, shallow moho depth, thin lithosphere, and uh, high surface heat flow. And uh, the thin lithosphere, to investigate the thin lithosphere for the NCC area, and uh, there are the long term and short term end members. And uh, the long lived thin lithosphere 
can be man the long lived thinner sphere uh, can be maintained the thin can be maintained by the hydro uh, by the subductions former subductions because the it will cause the hydrated mantles and leading to the vigorous mantle convections below the cordillera. Alternatively, the short lived thinner sphere is associated with the um, gravitational removal and uh, the west dipping features is like a lithospheric thick boundary beneath the cordillera and this study will test uh, whether delamination can happen in the past uh, through the geodynamic modeling and uh, i use the SOPAL program to demonstrate a 2d thermal mechanical models and uh, initial models approximates along the AA prom profile uh, showing the 2,000 kilometer width and 660 kilometer height. And boundary conditions for the both sides are no slip. And uh, this model has a very top surface and bottom and allowing the topography to develop. So the these different colors uh, show like the uh, different materials. And uh, all materials have viscous plastic rheology and temperature dependent densities. The two materials here is uh, assist to occur the delamination models, uh, such as the weak zone at the edge and the dense lower crust. So the initial crust is the 60 kilometer thick, and uh, it will assume the thick crust uh, because of the prior crustal thickening. And the weak zone at the edge uh, can be low old volcanic arc over localized shear zone generating low, low viscosity and uh, the we to avoid the boundary effect i put the lithosphere with a thick crust in the middle of the model plan and uh, the initial locations of the tintina fault mackenzie mountains cdf and the lithospheric thickness are based on the surface observations and uh, the, the initial temperature here it's calculated by the steady state thermal equations and the high heat generations. We will uh, compare the model predictions with the surface observations. Here, the gray dashed lines are the mean value for the surface table and uh, elevations. The gray shaded, shaded area are standard deviations. The movie will present the evolutions of the surface sea flow and the materials and the elevations relative to the cratones. Before the uh, delaminations, uh, the Mackenzie mountain shows the high topography at the one kilometers because of the thick crust here. And the weak zones, uh, when the weak zone is uh, removed by the gravitational instabilities, the the dense, uh, the lithosphere gap is formed. So the denser lower crust helps to uh, detach the mental lithosphere and uh, sinks into a stenosphere. The peak of the elevations uh, appears from the west to the east. And uh, the model also produced a widespread mental melt uh, showing in a pink color. And uh, the initial delaminations start, uh, sorry, the onset of delaminations is around 40 million years and the duration time is around 4 million years. We will, uh, we will look at the um, model results for 15 million years after the delaminations. And uh, here is the figure shows the model materials evolutions uh, before and after the delaminations. And after the delaminations, the surface heat flow increases by 25 microwatts per meter square over the 15 million years and showing in the different line types. And elevations grows by 1.5 kilometers. The crustal thickness decreases by four kilometers. And uh, generally, the, these uh, surface, surface predictions, like model predictions, agrees well with the uh, surface observations. However, this model uh, don't include a lot of surface erosions. And uh, to my, uh, if, if we consider about the surface erosion, maybe at least uh, predictions of the thick crust can be modified. Uh, to my understanding here, and we, if we consider the surface erosion parameters and uh, it will be the secondary effect in on our surface predictions. 
And uh, here that is the uh, selecting the three locations at 700, 800, 900 kilometers uh, demonstrates the relative elevations, surface heat flow, crustal thickness, and uh, mohole temperatures over time. And the uh, sudden so, so increment uh, in the surface observations corresponds to the onset of the denominations, excluding the surface heat flow. And uh, owing to the small duration for the denominations, so these uh, surface predictions uh, affected by the denominations almost at the same time. And uh, sorry, I want to mention that. Okay, so the for this, uh, for the shadow mantle, uh, change color from white to the pink and uh, representing the mantle melt. And uh, we will using the geotherm for these three locations to uh, illustrate the, whether there is the decompression melting. And the red line is the mantle solidus, blue line is the crustal solidus, gray line is the moho death. And uh, when the temperature is greater than the solidus, temperatures, it may generate a melt. And for the delaminations, uh, lithospheric thickness is around 100 kilometers. And when the uh, delamination happened, so the, this uh, did, uh, will thin the lithosphere at the locations 700 kilometers at here. So after that, and we will find out the mental temperature is greater is greater than mental solidus. So at for 15 million years, 17 million years, and 20 million years, we will see the uh, crossing areas. So that is mean the temperature is greater than mental solidus. It causes the crossing area. And uh, at the final, at about 29 million years, and we find out the lithosphere thickness is increases by five kilometers. The gray dot shows the mantle solid. Oh, sorry. The gray dot shows the model mantle melt and uh, the initial the initial decompression melting correlates with the onset of the delaminations. And uh, this model uh, will produce the model mantle melt until for 40 million years. And the total volume with the time indicates the maximum peak at 60 million years and decreases to until the 30 million years. And we're using the two nearby volcanoes eruptions to constrain the geologic time. Level Mountain erupted at 14.9 million years until uh, to the, from that time to the present time. So it will be a long-lived long volcanoes and uh, it produced the uh, largest uh, volcanic eruptions in the NCPP. Additionally, the Mount Ajizia and uh, also erupted at 7.4 million years until present. It is it produced the second largest um, volcanic eruptions in this area. If the dilemmations can occur like uh, occurred at 15 million years ago, so the present day of the um, present day will correlate to the model time at 29 million years. We look at the horizontal strain ratio together and find out the extension before the denominations, the extensions across the Mackenzie Mountains, it is generated by the uh, high topography. And uh, the areas, the extensions areas uh, migrate from the 650 to the 1000 kilometers. And uh, Surrounded by the the area with with the compressions, after the twenty million years, there is the uh, because the mental lithosphere is removed, so the extensions is above the thin lithosphere, and the compressions is uh, surrounded, so that is at the margins of the plateau. And uh, secondly, we find out the extensions around uh, encloses the model mental melt and uh, the compressions. Obvious compression appears in the Mackenzie Mountains and which is caused by the delaminations. And uh, in our results, 
and uh, in the summary, the dimensions model shows some con some consequences, and uh, these consequences uh, agrees with the sur uh, our surface observations, including the corridor lithosphere, corridor crust, surface topography, surface heat flow, mole temperature, mental temper melt in the last 15 million years. Magmatics and distribution in the NCBP and uh, crustal compression in the Mackenzie Mountains. And uh, the delamination models uh, le uh, leads to the recent thin lithosphere and uh, uh, widespread mantle melt to the west of the Tintina Fold and uh, involved crustal formations in the Mackenzie Mountains. And uh, this delamination model also implies the ongoing deformation in the Mackenzie Mountains. Thank you for your attention. Oh, thank you, Tai Cha. So it was an interesting talk. Um, so we have five minutes for questions. And we don't see any questions right now, but, oh, Russ is going to ask you something. Go ahead, Russ. All right. I think he's... Sorry, nice talk, Tai. We, we... We're just getting feedback in the room. Turn the volume down. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, nice talk. Can you just go back one slide, Tai Chi? I was I was curious by your results there. So it, it seemed to it seemed to be showing a zone of contraction, then a little pulse of extension. Is that right? I I'm kind of looking where it goes in time from red. See in the in the remove zone there, yeah, just above your cursor there, yeah, like it, it goes from red to blue and then back to red. So that's a little oh. pulse of extension that occurs amidst shortening. Is that right? Am I am I reading that? And and can you can you just explain a little bit about what's happening there? Why why is there that reversal in time? It's fairly quick. You, you mean less less distance or like uh, this one, less locations from red to blue and red and blue again. You mean list locations or? So, so okay. So from my understanding your question, I I think I will explain this again. And uh, this one is the uh, extension pattern and uh, that is uh, caused by delaminations. And uh, okay, so so for the for the delamination happened because that is the uh, uh, detachment mental lithosphere pulling down, and uh, then they will have the uh, mental convections over because the dis disappear of the they have the lithosphere gap uh, happening there. So that's why they have the extensions uh, at that top. So that will be migration for like extension patterns. So from 615 until 1000. And uh, it will become the whole, um, vertical one because mental lithosphere is just removed. So everything is fixed. And uh, then there will be extensions fixed uh, at uh, like a thin, like a plateau holding up the plateau. So, so beneath the plateau, that is the extensions. And uh, also, outside the plateau at the margins of the plateau, that is the compressions. And uh, in our study, we find out our Mackenzie Mountain have more uh, obvious co compression pattern show up because we put the weight block layer and the weight block is the softening material. So these uh, dimensions uh, um, have some mental dynamic like force uh, down beneath the far away from the upper crust. So this kind of the compression is caused by the delamination, the mental lithosphere detachment. Yeah. Okay. And cool. uh, yeah, if we don't have the, this basin here, so they won't have the compression station. So that is mean the Mackenzie Mountain is like a sedimentary layer and uh, you need to have, so that why why we can see they have the compressions in the Mackenzie Mountain. And it is us what we observed today. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we have a little bit more time. If we have any more questions, I don't see any questions in the box. Um, let's wait a little bit or 
I think, yeah, it's time to move the next speaker. Thanks, Tai Cha. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Phil Aram, and he's going to talk about supercontinent classification. Stage is yours, Phil. Thanks very much, Erkan. Um, can everyone see my screen? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Okay, grand. Probably now. Yeah. Super. Um, yeah, it's been a nice session. Um, I'm just going to do kind of five, ten minutes on a kind of debate that's happening currently in the, in, in geodynamics on supercontinent classification. Uh, we myself and my co-authors published a paper uh, last year on this topic. What's quite interesting is that uh, in the geoscience community, we don't really have a formal definition of what a supercontinent is, um, which may be quite surprising to people who don't think about supercontinents as often as I do, but there's, there's not something that ties, there's not a formal definition that you could look up and everyone be like, agree with. And I always find that this really interesting. Um, so in preparation for this talk, I decided to uh, kind of pose a question on on Twitter uh, of what actually makes a supercontinent super, just to see what the geoscience community would come back with. Uh, as to say, I thought it'd be fun. This is the type of thing that I do for fun, is uh, what makes a supercontinent super. Um, and I gave four options, one of them being size, one of them being impact, and one of them being both, both size and impact, and uh, other, and a space for someone to write. Uh, whatever they would, what how they would define a supercontinent. Um, have a think of what you would put down uh, if you were coming at this from an from an idea of what you think a supercontinent, what makes a supercontinent super. Uh, the fifty six people who replied it was overwhelmingly its size, which is quite interesting. So, what makes a supercontinent super? Its size, but that that doesn't really give very much information because um, if you look at Pangaea, 320 million years ago, and, and Rodinia, 900 million years ago, quite kind of different in size. One thing's for sure, it's not 100% of all the continental material forming one large plate. It is most of the continental material, but not, not all, uh, especially for Rodinia, it's not all of the continental material. So when it, it's size, what does, it, what does that mean? Um, is that some? Is that uh, there's been suggestions in the literature of 75%, that seems, almost arbitrary. Um, so to me, it does, it's not, size isn't sufficient to do it. But actually when we talk about supercontinents in, in the literature, we also have certain geomarkers for identification that kind of tie Pangea and Rodinia together, such as, you know, there was global scale orogenesis, there was crustal growth, there was rapid climate swings, there was major life and atmospheric events, uh, there was sea level change, and there was a kind of an impact from, from large US provinces that are related. Um, one of the comments that was made in the, in the kind of other category, which is a, a definition which I quite like, is, is that is, is around mantle impact. So it was a, from a paper from uh, Pastor Galan and, and co authors in 2018, where they suggest that a supercontinent should be defined as a single continental plate with a size capable of modifying or controlling mantle dynamics and core mantle boundary processes, altering convection cells and enhancing thermal activity. I quite like that um, that definition myself. I think it's I think it's quite interesting because it, it doesn't really give a size, but it gives something that should be big enough to to impact what's what's going on below. But what's going on below in 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 kind of deep time is quite hard to quite hard to capture. And the reason why I'm sharing this this kind of discussion is because um, there is a bit of uh, back and forth in the community of, of whether other continental material that, um, that amalgamated together could be classified as a supercontinent. One of them is, um, is, is a group of continental material called Pinocha. So Pinocha is uh, Laurentia, Siberia, Amazonia, and Baltica that around 650 million years ago formed this tiny collection of continental material um, here for, for actually not a very long amount of time. So it's not even it's very small amount of continental material put together, but a couple of people are, are promoting this as, as potential uh, supercontinent in between Rodinia and, and Pangea. 
So around 600 million years ago, there was the there was a Lodginus province called the Central Iapetus Magmatic, Magmatic, Magmatic Province, which led to the breakup around 550 million years ago. So it didn't even last very long, and it was quite small. Um, but this Pinocia actually had orogenesis related to it. It had crustal growth. It had a climate swing attached to it. There was there was a kind of a major atmospheric event. There was sea level change, and there was a Lodginus province. So if we take out the fact that it's tiny, these geomarkers are the same as Pangaea and Rodinia. So in our paper that we wrote uh, last year, we thought it'd be kind of fun and interesting just to run a, a mantle convection model, just to see if there's some sort of fingerprint of a supercontinent on the mantle that you could say, okay, well, maybe that that is a kind of identification that we could use from numerical models. So I'm, I'm not, the, there's a lot of detail in the paper. I'm not going to go into it here, but what we did was we used uh, 3D mantle convection models using aspect and uh, used a plate reconstruction histories as our surface velocities and ran them forward in time, well, forward from 410 million years for the Pangaea models to, to the present day and studied the, the interior dynamics. One of the things that kind of came out is the, is the change in basal heat flux. And we found that for Pangaea, there was a kind of an increase in basal heat flux during the formation, during the uh, Pangaea, Mal Pangaea time. And then we did the same thing for plate reconstruction histories for Rodinia and Pinocia and found that there was a basal, basal heat flux from the Comatlo boundary uh, for Rodinia. And also you could see during the fleeting Pinocia time, there was also a, uh, an increase as well, and then a, a flattening off as, as the breakup of the supercontinent. So just by running these kind of simple, simple models, you could say, okay, well, there may be some sort of mantle fingerprint. This is just an initial study. This is just something to kind of get the conversation going. Um, but in terms of these geomarkers, yeah, there, there could be some sort of mantle change related to Pangaea that's also seen in Rodinia and Pinocia. Um, that could also help this case of Pinocia being a supercontinent. But again, it's really tiny and the consensus, general consensus, 56 people on the Twitter poll, is that size is really important. So this would never be classified as a supercontinent. So the, the point of me just talking now is, is mainly just to kind of highlight um, what, what does make a supercontinent super? Is, is a focus on size of a supercontinent distracting? Do we should be looking at what more of the impact? I really like this um, this definition. It'd be interesting to see if anyone else does. And can we? Is there a way to use numerical models to try and understand this mantle fingerprint for, for ident identifying supercontinents or identifying uh, points in the geological history that could be uh, that could be useful in terms of how our, how our planets evolved? Or are they too speculative? Do we not know enough yet? Um, so that's my that's my talk. Um, yeah. So any questions? Thanks, happy to take them. Uh, any comments? Happy to take them. If anyone wants to add their vote to the Twitter feed, I'm happy to take that as well. Oh, and the paper is, is here if you're interested. Uh, thanks for this eye-opening talk, Phil. It was interesting to think about the classification of supercontinents. Uh, we have some time for questions. Um, I don't see anything right now. Everyone agrees with size. That's why. Yeah, I will. I will choose the same option. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Julia has a question. Go ahead, Julia. Okay, thanks. Hi, Phil. Um, I was Hi, just you. wondering if you've sort of tested in the numerical models like a threshold for size of a supercontinent that would still meet the criteria that those authors gave if that makes sense <laughs> like that what's the smallest size that would still influence the core mental boundary etc yeah that's a that's a really it's a really good question actually we, we've done it we've done a few um, previous studies myself and and oh. julian norman looking at uh, how small a supercontinent can be before it starts to ch develop uh, plumes underneath and um we haven't we've done that a little bit in 3d as well but it's also 
very dependent on initial initial conditions. So I think it'd be quite good, yeah, that to, to kind of run this model again, but make Pinocchio type smaller and smaller to see if it has a has an impact. That's a really good, that's a really good suggestion, actually. So I haven't looked at that. These are just kind of an initial discussion to get the to get the conversation started. But that's a really good point. Should have had you as a reviewer, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a cool study at least. <laughs> We have one more question from Phil McCausland. Thanks, Phil. Nice talk. For both Rodinia and Pangea, the model of Basel and heat flux seems to have increased a lot before the supercontinent time. And then a drop from um, uh, 550 to CA, um, 450 MA. What else is going to influence basal heat flux over what area? Yeah, it's a it's a another good question. Um, the the drop between five fifty that's the that's the end of the model, isn't it? The five fifty one. Um, the model between yeah, these are two separate models. So the 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 the, the plate reconstruction issue doesn't doesn't match up. Um, so if there was a continuous model for a billion years, that that would also kind of be nice smooth change that you could probably map and probably see better in the basal heat flux but it's hard to because these are global models and also the, these are basal heat flux models that are average of the whole whole system it's quite, also quite difficult to tell what is causing these specific basal heat flux the Pinocchio basal heat flux could be due to the fact that there's something happening in a different part of the of the model that isn't actually in the Pinocchio this is just a, a global response so um, a kind of a localized look at what is happening underneath, say, Pinocchio could be a better, a better analysis, um, if that answers your question. Um, thanks, Phil. Um, we, we reached the end of the session for today. Um, uh, so before closing today's session, I want to thank to our, our eight speakers once again, Joshua, Hossein, Judith, Shihong, David, Julia, Taicha, and Phil sharing for their interviewing research with us today. I also want to thank you for attending and contributing with your questions to the first part of the Lithosphere Tectonics and Mantle Dynamics session. And please mark your calendars for July 15th and join us the second part of our session along with the general solid earth um, talks. Um, the CGO meeting will continue this Thursday and next Tuesday with two hydro hydrology um, sessions that focus on cold regions and permafrost hydrology and hydrogeology. And also Claire and Russ, thank you for organizing the session. And that will be all. See you next time. <laughs>